Chapter 6 Gretchen got up earlier than usual on Monday morning to fix a good breakfast for Reginald before he left for his first day of work. She badly wanted his job to work out well. It would make her feel all that much closer to her friends. By the time he woke, she had the bacon finished and was working on eggs and toast. She put a hot cup of coffee on the table in front of him as soon as he sat down. You're going to spoil me. She laughed. Don't get used to it. Remember, I'm having this baby soon, and then it'll be a little harder for me to dote on you all the time. I'll have to pay attention to our little one. Are you scared about having the baby? He asked. She shook her head. Not really. I mean, I know there's a lot of pain involved, but I'm young and strong. And I'm ready to hold our baby in my arms. I both wish I could have a few more months with just the two of us and have the baby tomorrow. Which doesn't make a lick of sense. He laughed. Maybe it doesn't, but I still understand it. I'm not sure I'm ready for the baby to be born yet, but I haven't had months and months to get used to the idea like you have. She scooped his eggs onto a plate, added bacon and toast, and took it to him. I guess you're going to have to get used to the idea as fast as possible. Have you decided yet if you're going to see your mother this week? He asked as he took a small bite of the bacon. She fixed her own plate while she thought about the question. I think I'll go see her tomorrow. I do want her to be with me when the baby is born. It doesn't make sense that she wouldn't be. I think that's a really good idea. She needs to know that you want her there. She may think you won't after everything that's been said in the past few months. I'm kind of torn, to be honest with you. I want her there, but I don't want her there. I want her love and support, if she can find it within her to give that. If she can't, I'd rather she not come at all. She walked to the table with her plate and sat down opposite him. I'm going to be working on the baby quilt at Doris's today. Will that take all day? he asked, having no idea how those things worked. Yes, it will take all day. Rika will join us after school, and it will be all the three of us can do to finish it before you're off work. We'll probably eat dinner at the butler's house again because I won't have time to cook. I hope you like Harve because we'll be spending a lot of time with them. I do like Harve. He's someone I could be friends with easily. Reginald frowned at her. Do we have a lunch pail for me to take to work with me? She nodded. And I saved some of last night's supper for you to take with you. I'll get it ready before I do the breakfast dishes. Will you walk into town with me this morning? I'm not sure I'll be ready to leave when you need to. I have to make you lunch, get the dishes done, and figure out where I put the quilt blocks I've made. I have an hour before I need to leave. I think that should be enough time, don't you? Probably. I'll hurry. An hour later, he was carrying her box of quilt blocks into town, and she was carrying his lunch. I hope your first day of work is all you want it to be. He shrugged. Work is work. I'll do everything I can to earn my wage and be thankful to get it. When they reached the sawmill, he took his lunch pail and handed her the box. Have a good day. He leaned down and kissed her softly. I'm so glad I get to kiss you again. She watched him head into the mill, before walking around the back to the butler's house. Asterisk. The following morning, after Reginald was on his way to work, Gretchen walked toward her parents' ranch. She was nervous about talking to her mother, but she really hoped things would be easier between them like they had been in the past. She took a deep breath before knocking on the door, feeling odd to be knocking and not just walking in. This house had been her home for her entire life until days before, and now she felt like she needed to knock. It was very strange. Her mother opened the door, a slow smile lighting up her face. I wasn't sure you'd be visiting me. Gretchen smiled. You're still my mother. May I come in? Of course. How are things between you and Reginald? Is everything going well? Yes, it is. 
We're still working through some things, but I know we'll be happy together. There's enough love between us to ensure that. Of course, there still wasn't trust, but hopefully that would happen soon. Sit down. I'll put a pot of tea on for us. Her mother indicated the kitchen table, and Gretchen sat down at it as if she was an honored guest and not the prodigal daughter returning. Thanks. Gretchen waited until she had the cup of tea in front of her, and her mother was sitting as well before she brought up the real reason for her visit. I wanted to ask if you'd be there when the baby is born. Her mother's eyes widened and filled with tears. Of course I will. I was sad knowing you wouldn't be here for the birth of the baby. Really? Yes. I want you to be happy. Now that Reginald's back, I'm sure you will be. He's a good man, and he's always made you very happy. It's been written all over your face. I'm glad he's here with you again. Me too. Gretchen took a deep breath. His mother still hates me. She says horrible things as soon as he leaves the room. It was something Gretchen had spoken to her mother about many times before Reginald had died, and she knew her mother would give her good advice. That woman is just plain evil. I don't think she's ever going to like you or anything you do. Her mother shook her head. I don't know how she's going to be once the baby is born. Hopefully better, but with someone like her, you never can tell. I know. I'm not looking forward to having to spend more time with her now that Reginald is back again. He wrote me a note before he left and asked her to give it to me, and instead she came to me and told me that he was dead. Gretchen shook her head. She'd have done anything to keep me from marrying him. I tried to make the first move and invited them to Sunday lunch, but she refused to come. Stop trying. If she wants to be part of the baby's life, she'll come around. If she doesn't, then you won't lose anything. Her mother sighed. Is Reginald starting at the bank? Gretchen grinned. He started working at the sawmill in town yesterday. He told his father he prefers working with his hands. Oh, I'm happy for him. He should do what he wants to do, not what his parents think he should do. Her mother looked down at her cup of tea for a moment. What about the women in town? Are they talking to you now that you're married? It's like nothing ever happened. It's the oddest thing. Mrs. Linden says she's going to spread rumors about the baby not being Reginald's, but everyone is treating me well, at least for now. I'm glad you have your friends. And you have me. I'm sorry I was so ugly to you about the baby. I just saw you throwing your entire life away for the baby, and I couldn't let that happen. Gretchen covered her mother's hand with her own. I know, Mama. I understand. I don't deserve your understanding, but thank you. Her mother wiped away a tear. I made an afghan for the baby. Do you want to see it? The rest of the day was spent with her mother, enjoying their time like they used to. Finally, it was time for Gretchen to go. I need to get home and fix supper. Thank you for the Afghan and the lovely visit, Mama. I hope you'll be back at church on Sunday. Her mother had taken to not leaving the ranch since Gretchen had started showing. I'll be there. Thank you for forgiving me. Gretchen hugged her mother close. I'll see you soon. As she walked home, she realized that Reginald's reappearance really had fixed a lot of things. People looked at her differently now that she was married even though the circumstances were still the same. She may never understand it, but she was grateful not to be a pariah any longer. After supper that evening, she and Reginald sat together holding hands and talking. She told him how well the visit with her mother had gone, and he talked about his day at the mill. She looked at him just before bedtime. I'm so glad you're back. My whole life has changed completely since you returned. I'm just sorry to cause you so much misery before. I had no idea any of that would happen while I was gone. He shook his head. I will never again make such a big decision without consulting you. She smiled at his words. 
I appreciate that. He caught her hand and pulled her onto his lap, the first time he'd done that since his return. I'm going to crush you. He laughed at that. You still weigh nothing, even big with my child. He stroked his hands over her back. I missed you so much. I missed kissing you and touching you. She pressed her lips to his. I missed you, too. He stroked his hands up her arms to her shoulders, moving them behind her to hold her tightly. I hate having to stop touching you. She frowned at that. I know, but I still don't think I could let you see me like this. Even though it's your baby, I'm huge. Then I'll just be content to kiss you and hold you. I love you, Gretchen. I hope you know I never stopped. He pulled her head down and really kissed her, tracing her soft lips with his tongue while his hand stroked over her back. I would lie in bed at night, remembering our one time together. I thought about kissing you and making love to you again. And then I worked myself half to death every day so that I'd be able to sleep and dream of you again. It was the same for me, but I thought I'd only have dreams for the rest of my life. She rested her head on his shoulder, so happy to be close to him. We need to go to sleep so we can face our days tomorrow. What do you have planned tomorrow? he asked. Doris and I are working on quilts for the girls. I'll be home in time to fix supper, though. He nodded, wishing she'd spend a little more time at their home, but understanding with all the time she'd been alone during his absence, she did need to have friends around her. He couldn't wait for the baby to be born so he'd have his wife back. Chapter 7 Two weeks later, in the middle of the night, Gretchen woke up in pain. She stood up to go to the outhouse and felt water dripping down her legs. She frowned for a moment, and then her eyes widened as she realized what had happened. She grabbed a clean nightgown and changed before waking Reginald. I need you to go get Widow Larkin. The baby's coming. He rolled out of bed and reached for his pants in one motion. I'll get her, and then your mother. What about my mother? She shook her head. I don't want her here for the baby's birth. You can tell her once he or she is here. He understood why she felt that way completely. He wouldn't argue with her decision either. He would tell his mother when she said he could and not a moment before. Asterisk. It was mid-morning when the baby was placed in Reginald's arms by his mother-in-law. It's a boy. What will you call him? He frowned as he looked down at the child in his arms. What did he know about naming babies? I'm not sure. He'd never held a baby before, and he was half afraid he was going to drop him. She laughed. Most parents have names picked out before the baby is born, but hopefully you'll pick something soon. She walked to his kitchen and put on some water for tea. I'm making tea for Gretchen while Widow Larkin cleans her up. You'll be able to see her in a few minutes. He wasn't sure what to do with the baby during those few minutes. Should I just sit and hold him? Mrs. Jensen laughed. Yes, just hold him. He'll just sleep until he's hungry. Are you going to stay and help us with him? I don't think I'll need to. You'll be surprised at how quickly Gretchen is up and moving around. She walked back to him looking at him holding her grandson. I'm glad you're home. I don't know how Gretchen would have made it through without you here. She's strong. She is. But she needed you with her. I don't think you have any idea just how rough it's been for her. He looked down into the baby's face, knowing it had been so hard because of him and his child she'd carried. Things will be better now. Are you going to tell your mother about the baby today? She's going to want to come see him. I don't know. When Gretchen is ready, I'll go tell her. I'm not sure she needs to be in our home until Gretchen is fully recovered. He didn't want to think of what his mother would think of to say to his precious wife. Why she made things so difficult for Gretchen, he would never understand. That's a good idea. I'll help as much as I can. She walked back into the kitchen to fix the tea, 
leaving him there holding the baby. The midwife came out of the bedroom then. You can see her if you'd like. Reginald wanted to pass off the baby, but he was sure his wife would like to see him even though he felt uncomfortable holding him. He walked into the room and sat down on the edge of the bed. He's beautiful. Gretchen smiled. What are we going to call him? He shrugged. I have no idea. You had said Reginald, but I don't know if I like the idea of naming him after me. What about Stanley? I met a man named Stanley while I was logging, and he was extremely helpful to me. Would that name be all right? She nodded. I like it. Stanley. When should I tell my mother? She sighed. I know you need to tell her, but I'd rather you didn't. If I do it now, while your mother is still here, it might be easier for you. He wasn't looking forward to telling her either. The baby was born on a Sunday morning, so he could tell both of his parents at once, which should make things a little easier. That's a good idea. Yes, give him to me, and go tell your parents. As much as she loathed the idea of seeing her mother-in-law, she couldn't keep her son away from her. No woman should be kept from her grandchildren. Reginald passed the baby to her. Don't let your mother leave yet. Gretchen laughed. She's not in a hurry. She wants to hold her grandchild as much as I want to hold my baby. Then I'll hurry. He walked to the door and stopped, turning back to her. Thank you for my son. With those words, he was gone. He went out and saddled his horse, riding to his parents' home. They should be just getting home from church, and he wanted to get to them before they were settled in for the day. He knew how much his parents hated to leave their home once they were settled. When he walked into the parlor, where they were sitting talking, he smiled. Gretchen had a baby boy this morning. His mother stood and walked to him, hugging him. A boy. When can we see him? Now if you'd like. Gretchen sent me to tell you. She did? His mother truly looked confused. She did. She wants you to see him. Let me get my coat. His mother hurried off, ready to go see the baby, while his father hitched up the wagon. He rode back to the cabin without them, wanting everyone to be prepared for the arrival of his mother. When he walked into the house, his mother-in-law was sitting with Gretchen in the kitchen. Where's Widow Larkin? She's already left. Gretchen's doing fine. Gretchen smiled, looking up from the baby. I think he has your smile. I'm not sure you can tell yet. I can. She tilted her head to one side, watching him. Are your parents coming? Yes, they're on their way. Are you ready to see them? Her mother stood up. I'm going to make some more tea. Five minutes later, his parents arrived, and his mother rushed over to look down at the baby. He looks just like you did when you were first born, Reginald. Gretchen said nothing, waiting for the other shoe to drop. That's what Gretchen was just saying, Reginald said. Well, that he looks like me. She wouldn't have known what I looked like as a baby. I'd like to hold him, his mother announced. He is my grandson, after all. Gretchen nodded, handing him to her mother-in-law, but watching her like a hawk. She wasn't certain what the woman would do. She seemed happy, but Gretchen never knew when she'd strike. After a moment of staring down into his face, Mrs. Linden said, You made a beautiful baby, Gretchen. I'm surprised. Why is that? Reginald asked. He hoped his mother wasn't about to say something unkind. I just didn't expect the baby to be quite so handsome. Sitting in a hard-backed chair at the table, Mrs. Linden reached for the tea her mother had set there. Thank you for inviting me to come see him, Gretchen. I'm sure that wasn't easy for you. Gretchen nodded. I would never keep a child away from his grandmother. No matter how much she deserved it. I appreciate that. Mrs. Linden looked at her husband. Did you see the baby? 
doesn't he look just like Reginald did? Maybe you'll have your banker after all. I would like that. Mr. Linden didn't make a move to hold the baby, but he did stand over his wife, looking down at him. We'll have to make sure he excels in arithmetic and learns his numbers early. Reginald wanted to tell them not to plan his son's life out before he could even crawl, but he couldn't. Not then when they were all getting along so well. Gretchen's mother sat down with the others, obviously watching out for her daughter. I'll be in and out to help you all week. Then I'll help the next week, Mrs. Linden announced. I get to help my daughter-in-law and spend time with my grandbaby, too. Gretchen felt fear rush through her at the very idea. She was too fragile emotionally after the baby was born. All she wanted to do was cry, and the woman who had done everything she could to make her life a living hell was going to come and help her for a week. She wasn't sure she could handle things. I think I'll be ready to be on my own in another week, Gretchen said, hoping no one would think she just didn't want Mrs. Linden there. It was the truth, but she didn't want to be obvious about it. Mrs. Linden laughed and shook her head. Nonsense, child. I'll come and prepare your meals, and you can give all your attention to the baby. Why, if I knew of someone available, I'd hire someone to come in and help, but since I don't know of anyone, I'll be here for you. Thank you, Gretchen choked out. She hoped she could convince her husband to find a way for her mother-in-law not to be there with her, but she wasn't sure if that was even possible. It's my pleasure. Mrs. Linden stood and nodded toward the door. I'll see you Monday of next week. Her voice was authoritative as she left the little cabin, leaving three people sitting around the small table staring at each other, wondering how they could fix the problem without hurting feelings. I'm not sure I can handle her coming every day for a week, Gretchen said softly. Reginald frowned at her. I think she's changing. You need to give her another chance, instead of immediately assuming she's up to no good. Gretchen nodded, getting to her feet. I'm going to go feed the baby. He noticed the baby was sound asleep, but said nothing. If she needed to go sulk, because she had to spend time with his mother, then she could just do that. Her mother looked over at him, biting her lip. She looked as if she was trying to decide whether or not to say something. I don't think you have any idea just how cruel your mother has been to Gretchen. She's done everything she can to be kind and always polite. I don't know if it's a good idea for her to come here while Gretchen is alone with the baby. He felt an unreasonable anger build up inside him. Why does everyone look at her as if she's a villain? She was very nice to Gretchen while she was here, and she offered to help her as she gets back on her feet after having the baby. I don't think we should be turning down any offers of help at the moment. She nodded. All right. I'll start supper. He watched her move away from him, trying to figure out exactly what was wrong with all the women in their town. They all believed negative things about his mother but they called themselves Christians. Didn't they believe she could change? Asterisk. Things were strained between Gretchen and Reginald after that day. He stayed home from work as promised, and he made things as easy on Gretchen and her mother as possible, but he was still angry about the way they'd wanted him to refuse his mother's help. Nothing had been resolved when he went back to work the following Monday, and Gretchen seemed very nervous about his mother coming. Her mother had baked some bread and cookies so she would have something to serve her. He didn't understand why his mother couldn't just cook whatever it was she wanted. She was there to help after all. He passed Doris and the twins on his way to work. Where are you headed? We thought we'd go out and spend the day with Gretchen. None of us have seen the baby yet, and quite frankly, I miss my friend. He nodded. Sounds good. I'm sure she'll enjoy the company. When he got to work, he was still more grumpy than usual, but he knew he'd get over it. By the time he got home from work, he was sure the women would have worked everything out between them, and Gretchen and his mother would be bosom buddies. Then his life would be more peaceful. Asterisk. Gretchen was finishing the breakfast dishes when she heard a knock on the door. 
She said a silent prayer that she would be able to hold her tongue and not let her anger show before opening it. Instead of seeing her mother-in-law, whose visit she'd been dreading, she saw Doris and the twins. Gretchen hugged her friend tightly. I can't even express how much I've missed you. My mother has been here every day and so have Reginald and the baby, but I needed some time with the sisters of my heart. Well, I'm here now. What can I help with? Gretchen shrugged. I really don't know. My mother has been here every day, and she's kept things up well. My baking is done. I need to fix lunch for my mother-in-law, but other than that, my chores are mostly done. Your mother-in-law? Doris's eyes were wide as she asked the question. Why is she coming? Gretchen took a deep breath and smiled. She's coming to help me out. My mother came over every day for a week, so it's her turn to help me today. I know because she told me. She's planning to come every day this week. Oh, dear. Do you want me to come every day? You need a buffer between you. Gretchen shrugged. She was perfectly pleasant when she came over the day Stanley was born. Reginald is certain she's turning over a new leaf, and she's going to be a loving grandmother and help me all week. Dora sat down heavily in a chair. Oh, I'm sure that's exactly how things are going to happen. She shook her head. I'll take care of lunch. You don't need her complaining about your cooking on top of everything else. Thank you for being here. I'll be here every day if you need me. I'm not letting that evil snake hurt my friend. She'll have to walk through me first. They both jumped at the knock on the door. Doris went to the icebox to see what she should fix for lunch, and Gretchen went to the door. Good morning, Mrs. Linden. Is Reginald here? No, ma'am. He starts working at the sawmill early. Gretchen stepped aside so her mother-in-law could enter the house. My friend Doris and her twins came to visit today as well. Well, isn't that nice? Did you ask her to come over because you were afraid of me? Mrs. Linden's face twisted into a grotesque parody of a smile. No. I didn't know she was coming until about ten minutes ago. I'm thrilled she's here, though, because it's always good to see a true friend. Gretchen went back over to the table and sat down. Would you like some tea and cookies? Mrs. Linden shook her head. No, I came here to help with my grandson. Where is he? He's in his cradle in the bedroom. Why is there only one bedroom in this shack you call a home? You need a bigger place to raise my grandchild. Mrs. Linden stood up and walked to the bedroom, opening the door. She picked up the baby and immediately changed his diaper. He was sopping wet. What kind of mother leaves her baby in a wet diaper? He's only been sleeping for a short while, and he was dry when I put him down. Gretchen could feel her mother-in-law's complaints growing by the minute. She wasn't sure she could handle another ten minutes of her, let alone an entire week. Well, you should check him more often. He's going to get a rash if you keep that up. Mrs. Linden sat down with the baby in her arms. It's certainly a good thing he looks so much like Reginald. You'd have had a hard time proving he was my grandson otherwise. Gretchen took a deep breath, mentally counting to keep calm. I don't feel the need to prove myself to you, Mrs. Linden. Reginald loves me, and I love him. That should be enough for you. My son married beneath him. You tricked him into marrying you by getting yourself pregnant. Gretchen closed her eyes, praying that she could keep her voice calm. I'm not sure if you understand how procreation works, Mrs. Linden, but I couldn't possibly have gotten myself pregnant. Your son cooperated a great deal. How dare you say that to me? You owe me respect as your mother-in-law. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Is there anything I can get you to make your stay more comfortable? Yes, get me a blanket. You keep this cabin too cold and this baby is going to catch his death. And fetch me some tea. Do you have any sweets made? 
Mrs. Linden held the baby with a smirk on her face. She had gotten her wish when Gretchen backed down. Gretchen said nothing else to her mother-in-law, instead walking over to Doris and making the tea. Her friend gave her a look that told her she wanted to be allowed to say whatever she wanted to Mrs. Linden, but Gretchen gave a slight shake of her head. She wanted to get along with her husband, so there would be no arguments in her home. Asterisk. By the time Mrs. Linden left that afternoon, Gretchen was exhausted both mentally and physically. She had waited on her mother-in-law while taking care of the baby and doing her household tasks, and she was berated the entire time by the beastly woman. As soon as she left, Dora sank into the chair, beside hers. I had Rika take the boys home with her after school and told her I'd come get them. I'm coming every day this week. You are not going to face that old witch alone. Gretchen let out a giggle. Did you just call my mother-in-law a witch? That was the kindest word I could think of to describe her. She's evil through and through. Thank you for being here for me. And yes, please come back. I know it's not pleasant for you either, but knowing you were here made it tolerable for me. I don't know if it would have been otherwise. Why is it that women have to put up with so much evil, from other women? Gretchen asked, shaking her head. I have no idea, but I will tell you that the women in this town are anything but normal. I've never seen anything like them. They're all led by Mrs. Linden. All except our uprising. Maybe we should start another, Doris wiggled her eyebrows and made Gretchen laugh. No, I think it's best if we don't. Reginald. It's a good thing you love him. He'd need to be taken out back and shot otherwise. Gretchen nodded as she watched her friend collect her girls. I'll be here at eight tomorrow. Thank you. Don't thank me. I didn't kill her for you or offer to help you hide the body if you killed her. Of course, I think it's a given that I'd do either of those things for you. With that, Doris was gone, and Gretchen was left with a smile. She wasn't certain she could stand another four days with her mother-in-law, but she had to try. For Reginald. Chapter 8 Reginald passed Doris on the way home, and he nodded to her and the girls. I hope you had a good day. Doris smiled sweetly. I'll let your wife tell you all about it. I need to get home and see to supper for my crew. He shrugged and kept walking, pleased that he was going to be home with his wife and son again. It had been very hard to leave them after a week at home with them. He wasn't certain why, but he definitely wanted to stay home and not work. He opened the door to the cabin and called out, Gretchen, I'm home. She turned from the stove a smile on her lips. Do you think I can't hear the door open? Am I deaf now that I've given birth? If I ever sing to you, you'll wish you were. He walked to her and pulled her into his arms. The midwife had said they had to wait six weeks before they could resume marital relations. Only five weeks to go. How was your day? It was interesting. Gretchen had already decided that there was no point being honest with him about how her day had gone. He wouldn't believe her anyway. He was convinced his mother could do no wrong, and until he saw it for himself, he would keep on believing that. I ran into Doris on the way home. She was here all day? She was. She made our supper actually. I'm just stirring it to keep it from burning. And she baked a couple of loaves of bread as well. He sniffed the air. Thank God for Doris. That woman can really cook. She's a wonderful cook. Are you hungry? It's ready as soon as you are. Is the baby sleeping? Yes, he's in his cradle. He'll wake up again, before we go to bed. He's starting to realize he's supposed to sleep at night and be awake during the day. Gretchen was proud of the baby and how well he was adapting to a normal sleep schedule. She'd heard stories of babies who only slept during the day for a month or two. Reginald took a seat at the table, pleased that her first day with his mother had gone so well. 
He'd known it was just a matter of time before his mother came around and loved Gretchen as much as he did. Oh, I talked to my father today. My sister wants to come over this weekend to see the baby. Is that all right? Gretchen had only very vague memories of his sister. She was several years older, and Gretchen had had very little to do with her in school. Yes, of course. Margaret's been married for three years, but she doesn't have any children yet. I know she wants them. It'll make her happy to be an auntie. Do you know what day she's coming? I'll make something special to serve with tea. Probably Saturday. She lives in the next town over, and her in-laws are very religious. They have a problem if she misses church. She nodded. Saturday sounds good. I'll have something ready for her. I'm sure mother can help you make something on Friday if you want, he suggested. He couldn't be happier about his mother coming over to help her as she got used to having the baby. That would be nice, Gretchen said, not willing to talk about his mother at all. How was work today? It was really hard to go back to work and leave you and Stanley. The workday was good, it just felt strange to leave. She put two bowls of stew on the table, before taking her own seat. We have cake for dessert as well. Doris is really spoiling us. What did my mother make, he asked. She mostly took care of the baby, Gretchen said, looking down at her food. I'm sure that was a big help. More than you'll ever know. She changed the subject to the baby and some of the faces he'd made that day. There was no way she could talk about his mother and not become angry. Asterisk. Reginald felt oddly at work the next day. It was as if Harve was upset with him about something, but he didn't know what it could be. Finally, when they sat down for their lunch break, he had a chance to ask. What's on your mind, Harf? You seem angry with me, and I'm not sure why. Have I done something wrong? Harf shook his head. Not at work, you haven't. You're a model employee. Then why are you acting so strangely? Reginald couldn't understand why his employer was angry with him. You really don't know? Reginald looked over at Daryl who shrugged, offering no help at all. I wouldn't ask if I did. I have a real problem with you forcing your wife to spend days with your mother. My wife won't let your wife sit there and have to take her abuse alone, so she's walking out there every day to help out, but really, she's just there to keep Gretchen from getting too upset. No man should ask his wife to put up with that kind of abuse. It's just not right. I don't know what you're talking about. Gretchen didn't say anything. Reginald was truly confused. His mother had been bad to Gretchen in the past, he knew, but that didn't mean that she was still being mean to her. She didn't tell you the things your mother said to her? Let me spell it out for you then. Your mother is an evil, mean witch, according to Doris. She said some downright rude and horrendous things to your wife yesterday, and your wife just took it all because she didn't want you to be upset with her. You need to stop your mother from helping every day. Do you realize your mother sat holding the baby all day and made your wife wait on her? I thought she was there to lend a hand. Reginald got to his feet. I'm going to head home now. I have a hard time believing Gretchen wouldn't tell me what was happening. Take the rest of the day off. You need to get things handled in your house. Reginald picked up his lunch pail and started toward home. He couldn't help but wonder why Gretchen wouldn't have told him if his mother was being as cruel as it sounded like she was. She'd always told him in the past. He decided to not go straight into the house. Usually when she cooked, Gretchen kept one of the windows open to air out the house. Hopefully he would be able to hear something from under that window. He knew it was a little underhanded, but he had to know the truth. Asterisk. Gretchen handed her mother-in-law her lunch. Can I get you anything else, Mrs. Linden? Yes, you can go away, leaving my son with my grandson and never come back. Don't you think you would be happier out east? Maybe in New York. I would give you the train fare. 
I told you four times yesterday, I'm not leaving my family for any reason. I love my husband and son. I'm nursing my newborn child. I can't leave him. Gretchen tried not to let her anger show. How many times was the woman going to offer to pay her way out of Oregon? Do either of you girls want anything else? Cookie. Pre said excitedly. I like cookies, Pauline said. Gretchen laughed. Let me get you some cookies. Your mama made some fresh this morning, and they're delicious. If you keep eating sweets the way you have been, you're going to be bigger than a house. I don't know what my son sees in you, Mrs. Linden said. Gretchen ignored her as she got the cookies and took them to the girls. You're both going to take a nap after your cookies. Pauline yawned. But we're not tired. Doris turned from the table. Listen to your Aunt Gretchen. You can nap in her big bed. Why do you let the girls call her Aunt Gretchen? They shouldn't be calling her something she isn't. She's not your sister or your husband's sister. Mrs. Linden complained about something constantly. Dora smiled sweetly. She's the sister of my heart. I have lots of sisters at home in Massachusetts, but Gretchen is closer to me than any of them. Gretchen smiled at Doris. Thank you, my dear friend. I hope you ladies realize you can't just choose your relatives. Trust me, if I could choose my relatives, Gretchen would never have set foot in my home, and she certainly never would have married my son. She's a trollop, and she's not good enough for him, and she never will be. Under the kitchen window, Reginald had heard enough. He walked around to the front door and straight to the table where his mother sat eating food, prepared by his wife and her friend while she berated them. Get out. You will never again set foot in my home, and you will not see me or your grandson unless we get a written apology. Then you'll make a formal apology in church telling everyone about the lies you told to keep me and Gretchen apart. He didn't even look at his mother as he pointed toward the door. Go. Gretchen stood beside the stove where Doris was doing her best not to look at the scene, but Gretchen watched everything, memorizing the look on her husband's face as he finally defended her to his mother. You don't mean that, Reginald. I've always taken care of you. Out. I don't need a mother who speaks to my wife that way. I'm finished with you until there are apologies. Mrs. Linden glared at Gretchen as she got to her feet. You had to run to him and tell him everything, didn't you? She said nothing. I found out from my employer that she was being mistreated, and his wife was having to be a witness to it all to protect her from you. Goodbye. Reginald was furious. Not only with his mother, but with his wife. Why hadn't she told him as soon as he'd come home from work the previous day? Obviously, Doris hadn't had a problem telling Harve what had transpired. Mrs. Linden left the house, slamming the door behind her, causing the whole cabin to shake. The baby immediately started to cry, and Gretchen hurried to him, picking him up and putting him to her shoulder. Shoo! Doris finished chopping the potatoes up for their supper and dropped them into a pot. You'll need to pop this in the oven for an hour before you eat it, she said, wiping her hands on her apron. I'm going to head home. You and Reginald need to have a talk, I suspect. Gretchen looked at her husband's face for the first time since his mother had left. He still looked furious, which surprised her. His mother was gone, so why was he still angry? She felt completely vindicated, knowing that he finally believed her and she would have thought he'd be happy as well. Do you need a ride back into town? Gretchen asked Doris. The twins are awfully tired. Doris pursed her lips for a moment, obviously considering it. If you wouldn't mind driving us into town that would really help, Reginald. I would say no, but it's the girls' nap time and I can't carry both of them. I don't mind at all. Let me go hitch up the wagon. As soon as he left the cabin, Doris walked over to Gretchen. He's angry with you for not telling him what was happening with his mother here. 
He must have heard about it from Harve, and no man wants to hear about something like that from his boss. I hadn't considered that, Gretchen said, frowning. He didn't believe anything else I told him, though. And you keep reminding him of that. He's in the wrong here, not you. But remember, there's no compromise unless both of you bend a little. With a quick hug for Gretchen and the baby, Doris took her girls by the hands and led them out the door. Gretchen stared at the closed door and thought about the fight she knew was going to come. For a moment, she thought about taking the baby to her mother's house while Reginald was taking Doris and the twins home, but she realized she wasn't that cowardly. No, she would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with her husband and make him see reason. She'd done nothing wrong. Chapter 9 Reginald stayed in the barn for a moment after unhitching the wagon. He was still furious with his wife for not telling him what was happening, and he didn't want to confront her when he was this angry. He didn't worry he'd hurt her in any way, but he might say some things he would later regret. When he finally felt calm enough, he went to the house and walked inside, sitting at the table. We need to talk. Yes, we do. I know you're angry with me, and I even understand why, but you need to hear me out. Gretchen held the sleeping baby in her arms. I'm going to put the baby down, and I'll be right back. He blinked a couple of times, having a hard time believing she was trying to take control of this discussion. He was the one who had been wronged here, not her. I'm not sure it's going to work that way. Gretchen laid the baby in his cradle and walked back into the kitchen, determined to have this discussion as calmly as possible, no matter whether or not she wanted to break something over his hard head. Would you like something to drink before we talk about this? He frowned at her. Some water would be nice. She got them each a glass of water, before sitting at the table, perpendicular to him. May I have a few minutes to explain what happened? I don't think so. You didn't tell me how my mother was treating you. Why wouldn't you tell me? I love you, and you know I would never stand for someone mistreating you. He still couldn't believe he'd had to hear it all from Harve instead of her. Why wouldn't I tell you? Because I have told you. Repeatedly. You always make an excuse for her. You asked me to give her the opportunity to change, and I did just that. She came into our home yesterday morning and told me it was a good thing Stanley looked like you or I never would have been able to prove he was your son. It went downhill from there. Your mother is a mean, vindictive witch, and I did my very best to get along with her because I knew how very much you wanted us to be able to act like family. Well, I'm done. You now know exactly how she treats me, and I will no longer tolerate it. My son should not see anyone treat his mother like that, or he will no longer have respect for me. It won't happen again. He frowned at her. What really bothers me is you didn't tell me. When I asked you how your day went yesterday, you simply said, interesting. You could have told me exactly what happened. And you would have believed me? You told me a week ago that you were sure she'd changed and she was coming here to help me. I've waited on her for two days. I've listened to her say horrible mean things about me. And do you know why I did it? For you. Because I wanted you to be happy. So if you want to be angry with me for doing what I thought you wanted me to do, you can just go ahead and be angry. I'm washing my hands of the entire situation. You may have contact with your mother all you want. You may take the baby to see her if you are there to listen to what she says to him. I will not be around her. I don't want you to be around her. I want you to tell me when people are unkind to you. I don't think that's too much to ask. Reginald shook his head at her. I never would have let her come here if I'd know she was treating you that way. I told you how she treated me while you were gone. I told you how she treated me when you returned. I told you how she would treat me when she came back. You ignored it all, telling me she'd changed. That woman is incapable of getting off her broom for long enough to change. He stared at her for a moment, slack-jawed. He'd never imagined she would speak about anyone that way. 
Where was his sweet Gretchen? Did you really just call my mother a witch? Yes, I did, and I will again and again. It's true. She just needs a pointy hat to wear and a big cauldron to stir. Gretchen sat back in her chair and took a sip of her water, realizing then she'd accomplished her goal by not raising her voice, but he knew where she stood. She wanted to get up and do a dance, but instead she sat calmly watching him, waiting for his response. I guess you're right. She's only ever shown you a very ugly side. I've never seen that side, but I know my sister has. You'll have to talk to her about what you've experienced on Saturday. You're not mad at me any longer? He shook his head. How could I be? You're right. I didn't let you tell me what was happening because I kept acting like you weren't giving her a chance, and I even thought you lied. No, I should have listened to you long before I did. I love you, and you're my wife. I don't have to be around her any longer, but I choose to be around you every day of my life. Gretchen was tentatively pleased with the outcome of their conversation. She didn't believe it would truly last because he was so changeable where his mother was concerned, but for now, she felt like she'd won a small victory. Asterisk. Margaret's visit wasn't at all what Gretchen had expected. Reginald's sister looked exactly like their mother, so much so that Gretchen actually flinched when she came to the door. Within five minutes, they were sitting at the table and talking over tea and cookies. I've heard rumors that my mother has been horrible to you. Almost as horrible as she was to me. Almost? Gretchen asked. She told me Reginald was dead after throwing away the note she'd promised to give me from him. And then she got every woman in town to shun me for being pregnant with his child and not being married. Margaret sighed. My mother had a son when she married my father. He was six, and she'd never been married. She's not one who has a right to throw stones. What happened to him? Gretchen was surprised she'd never heard Reginald mention him. He was killed by his favorite horse. Kicked in the head. It was the year before Reginald was born. I was only four at the time, but I have vague memories of him and I've asked my father about it all because I wanted to know what it was that I was remembering. So your mother had a child out of wedlock? Gretchen shook her head. The things she said to me about my loose morals. She's not a good person. I don't know how father bears to stay married to her. Reginald never saw any of that, though, because he was always mother's favorite. She doted on him in a way I could only dream of. If I wanted something special, she often bought it for Reginald. I wanted a special china doll once, and she actually bought it but put it up, telling me it was for Reginald's future daughters. That sounds exactly like the woman I know and despise. Why is she so mean? I've never been able to figure that out. My father said that she very much wanted me to be a boy and was very disappointed that I wasn't. I don't know if that's why, but I suspect it is. She doesn't like to have other women to compete with. She always felt like she was in competition with me for father's affection. And in competition with you for Reginald's. I think that's why she dislikes you so much. Mrs. Gottweiler told me there was a young lady your mother had picked out for Reginald, and when he was interested in me instead, she hated me. Margaret shook her head. Oh, I seriously doubt that. Mother would never have thought any woman was good enough for Reggie. She shrugged. Now let me see my nephew. I'm going to dote on him like no auntie has ever doted on a nephew. Gretchen smiled. And I'll let you. Chapter 10 For Christmas, when Stanley was just about two months old, Gretchen and Reginald decided to spend the holiday with their friends instead of going to see his mother. They would spend Christmas Eve with her parents, but Christmas Day would be a feast at Doris's house that would include Daryl and Rika as well. Gretchen spent the entire month of December making Christmas gifts for all the people she cared about. Her mother would receive a new apron with her name embroidered on the front. Her father would get a new red scarf. Red was his favorite color. 
For her friends, she made pretty handkerchiefs that were tatted along the sides, and their husbands would each receive new shirts. She made the girls rag dolls, and the boys would get gloves. The baby would get clothing that he wouldn't care about, but she couldn't think of anything at all to make for Reginald. She needed something that would show him just how much she cared for him. He had been good about not bringing his mother around, and true to his word, they had not visited. He'd spoken to his father a few times, who had begged him to back down, but he wouldn't do it. His wife meant too much to him for him to allow her to be mistreated. Finally, she decided to make him a pillow. She knew it was odd, but it was all she could think of. It would be a small pillow, shaped like a heart. She practiced what she'd say when he opened the package, because she needed the moment to be just perfect. She would exchange gifts with him on Christmas Eve morning, before they went to see others for the festivities. She woke early on Christmas Eve and made breakfast, having it waiting for him when he came out of their room. The baby's stirring, he told her. Would you mind getting him up while I put breakfast on the table? Reginald shrugged. I'll change his diaper, but I sure can't feed him the way you do. She laughed. I'll feed him. She'd gotten good at holding the baby with one arm while he nursed and eating with her free hand. It was a skill she'd never dreamed she'd need, but she found it was something she did quite naturally after a couple of months of motherhood. Five minutes later, she had breakfast on the table, and he brought her the baby. She praised him for changing him even though his diaper seemed to be bunched oddly and hanging awkwardly to one side. She'd just fix it when her husband wasn't looking. Reginald looked down at the table, seeing a gift wrapped in brown paper next to his plate. There was a pretty red bow wrapped around it. What's this? It's not Christmas until tomorrow. I know, but we're going to be with my parents later today and friends in town tomorrow. I wanted to give you your gift before the visiting started. She sat down in her chair, putting the baby to her breast. When Stanley was first born, she'd been too embarrassed to nurse him in front of Reginald, but that had gradually faded, and now she didn't mind so much. Reginald took the present and carefully untied the bow. He had no idea what she'd think to get him. He lacked for nothing. When he opened it, he took out the pillow there, looking down at it. A pillow? Yes, it's the significance that matters most. When you came back from Washington, I knew I still loved you, but I didn't feel like I could trust you. Even after you chased your mother away, I didn't feel like I could trust you to not change your mind and suddenly start believing that she had changed and would become kind. Over time, I've realized that you not only hold my heart in the palm of your hand, but you also hold my trust again. I love you with everything inside me, Reginald, and I want you to know that I trust you wholeheartedly. He swallowed hard. He knew he'd been in the wrong so many times where his mother was concerned, and he feared they'd never be able to get past her distrust of him. Are you sure? She nodded. I'm very sure. And do you know what else I'm sure of? He shook his head. I'm sure I have no idea what is going on in your mind. As long as he'd known her, and as much as he'd loved her, he'd had so much to learn once they married. I'm sure that the baby was born eight weeks ago. That means we've wasted the last two weeks. He grinned at her. Is that an invitation, my love? She laughed, nodding. Yes, it's definitely an invitation. Let's not make a baby again so quickly, though. I want Stanley to have brothers and sisters, but I also want a little time between babies. I'll do my best. He took her hand and brought it to his lips. I don't deserve your love. I've done so many things to wrong you, and I'm sorry for each one of them. I love you with everything inside me and I will spend the rest of my life doing everything I can to prove it to you. She smiled at him. You don't need to prove anything. You have my heart for now and for always. Epilogue After Christmas dinner had been eaten and the presents had been exchanged, the children ran off to play with their gifts, all but Stanley, who slept peacefully in his mother's arms. 
Why did you decide not to go to your parents for Christmas, Rika? Harv asked. I thought that was the plan. It was originally, but we did Christmas with them last weekend. I had other news to give them, and I knew they would be just as happy to get that news a few days early, freeing us up for Christmas. Gretchen had her suspicions what the news was, and she was all but bouncing with excitement. Does that mean? Rika laughed. Yes, we're expecting. I knew it. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Gretchen smiled down at the baby in her arms. Just think, soon you won't get to sleep either. That's all right. It'll be worth it to me. I have news, too, Doris said, a grin lighting up her face. Really? Rika almost squealed. Really? We saw the midwife last week, and she confirmed it, Doris smiled at Harve and threaded her fingers through his. We're soon going to be a family of seven. Rika and Doris both looked at Gretchen. Do you have news? Rika asked. Gretchen shook her head emphatically. I should hope not. This one is only two months old. No news from us. Maybe in a year or two. Is it silly that I'm a bit disappointed? Rika asked. I was hoping that all three of us Salmon sisters would have babies around the same time. Within a year is close enough for me. Gretchen said with a laugh. One of you just make sure to have a girl, so we can arrange a marriage. Reginald shook his head. No way. We're not going to start trying to control our son's life. He gets to choose who he loves and when, not us. Gretchen rested her head on his shoulder. I completely agree. I just kind of want to be real family with my sisters. You already are, Doris said. Real family lives in your heart. And that's where you are for me. And me, Rika said. Gretchen felt herself tear up. I'm getting all emotional, but you two are the ones expecting. Doesn't matter though. You're my sisters. She smiled up at Reginald before looking back at her friends. When I met you, I was an unmarried pregnant woman with a dead fiancé. Now I'm married to a dead man, and I have a beautiful son. But you two were the beginning of my life getting better. Thank you both from the bottom of my heart.